and we are live good morning everybody how are you guys doing today i hope you can see and hear me loud and clear um would be great if you can give me some feedback on that um i unfortunately can't see the likes and so on on linkedin so um yeah feel free to drop a like but if you're watching this on linkedin make sure to say hello in the chat and of course in all uh, or on all the other platforms the same let me know if you can hear and see me loud and clear and uh, yeah let's have a conversation today the topic of today's conversations is um, yeah current economic risks for the Caribbean. And um, yeah, I have some talking points prepared, some things that I want to touch on. And um, yeah, feel free to add your thoughts, ask your questions. And um, yeah, maybe if you want, we will also do some live call-ins later on. Um, haven't done that before, but maybe this is something new we are going to try out today. Yeah, shout out to Trinidad and Tobago, to Queasy8 Dyer. I probably completely butchered your name now, but nonetheless, good to see you. Hey, Chris, good morning. Great to have you here. Yeah, it looks like people coming in or joining in on LinkedIn. Um, by the way, what do you think is the better audio and video? Um, do you prefer LinkedIn? Do you prefer YouTube? Um, I personally think that YouTube is a little better to navigate, but uh, I really like the event function on LinkedIn. Hey, good morning to Houston. Oh, TX, I was thinking, thinking uh, Texas, but I'm also seeing Dominica here, so I'm a little bit confused. Um, Ted, are you in Houston, Texas, or are you calling in or joining from Dominica? Let me know. And of course, um, yeah, we have some Jamaican guests today. Hi, Denise. Great to see and meet you today. Thanks for joining. All right. Um, yeah, while people joining, um, I just want to share a little or some thoughts um, I have around the current situation because I think, um, yeah, at least in my eyes, in my opinion, um, yeah, the news are um, changing so fast um, these days that we sometimes get a little, yeah, maybe caught up in the day-to-day -day, uh, news cycle and maybe losing a little bit the, um, yeah, 30,000 feet foot overview um, on, on what is actually happening on a global scale. So that is what I am want to do, trying to do today, meaning, yeah, we have a little top-down approach. Let's have a let, look at the planet, planet and, uh, yeah, what is going on globally, and then maybe drown, uh, yeah, drill down a little and uh, have a little closer look um, into the Caribbean and, yeah, how the different uh, events affect the Caribbean as a whole. Okay, Ted, in Texas, but from Dominica. All right, now I got it. Perfect. Dr. Vindel, another guest from Jamaica. So yeah, we have people from all over the Caribbean joining today. And um, yeah, we have uh, already the first questions. Um, again, feel free to add your questions uh, into the is that the right way to pronounce it? Yeah, into the chat. And then, um, yeah, I will try to get to all of them and try to answer them to the best of my abilities. So the first question, one question is, how can the Caribbean mitigate the economic impact of climate change against the backdrop of COVID-19, supply chain disruptions, and increasing costs of insurance? Um, I think a very Good and very interesting question, uh, one that I haven't thought so deeply before this live stream yet, to be completely honest. Um, but I think it's uh, certainly an important question. And uh, yeah, I will try to touch on it, 
answer it to the best of my abilities and dive a little deeper onto it later on during this live stream. Hi, Robert. Shout out again to Dominica. A few guests from Dominica today. Great to see that. All right. Um, so, yeah, why did I, well, what sparked the, the idea for the topic of today's um, conversation and live stream? And again, um, yeah, I'm thinking about um, dropping the link to the live stream studio. So if you're thinking um, about joining me, meaning you would be live with me here and yeah, maybe have a conversation or add your thoughts, um, let me know, drop it in the chat. And uh, if we have a yeah, few people that might be interested in that, then I maybe will drop the, yeah, the link into the chat so that you guys can join. Yeah, the little experiment. Let's see how that goes. Um, but yeah, the main reason why I wanted to talk about uh, yeah the topic today is that, um, at least in my opinion, we see a few developments um, unfolding over the last months. Um, and I think, um, yeah, we do not talk about them enough. And uh, yeah, I think I use that uh, opportunity today. So one uh, topic I want to talk about is inflation. I think um, yeah, everybody listening or watching right now uh, probably experienced that over the last months, uh, yeah, more or less. Uh, I want to talk about um, global debt risk or rather the default um, of some yeah, debt on a global scale and the yeah, implications that might have for the global economy. Um, I want to, yeah, in that scenario, touch a little bit on, on the current situation in China with Evergrande and the real estate sector there. Um, I want to touch a little, uh, really quick on the student loan debt situation in the US and how that might um, affect, um, yeah, the global economy. We'll talk a little bit um, about the current supply chain shortage, uh, meaning, yeah, you hopefully have already ordered your Christmas presents. Um, otherwise, yeah, there might be a not so happy surprise. And um, of course, um, I will try to dive a little deeper on the question from probably mispronounce your first name. So I go with the last name, Mr. Salazar, um, how yeah, the current uh, climate change situation yeah, affects the Caribbean uh, and yeah, supply chain disruptions and yeah, how maybe, uh, what are different solutions um, to that, uh, to that situations, and how can we mitigate some risks here? So I prepared um, yeah, some screens, or not some screens, some um, slides for you to get a little visual representation um, of the current situation. So what we see here is the GDP of Latin America and the Caribbean over the last. Um, yeah, what is that? 70 years almost since 1960. And um, yeah, what we can see very clearly here is that we have uh, yeah, that kind of nosedive um, in 2020, um, of course, caused by the current COVID-19 pandemic and uh, yeah, the high dependency that the Caribbean has as a whole on tourism and uh, trade and so on. And I think we can see very dramatically here um, yeah, how basically the GDP um, is on a level of 2008, 2010 right now. Um, but I think that's only one, yeah, one uh, aspect of the, of the current situation. Um, why do I think it's important that we talk about um, inflation? and how that ties into um, the whole supply chain mess that we're having um, right now. So what we're seeing here is the inflation rate, um, again, in Latin America and the Caribbean from 2011 till 2021, or the projections for 2021. Um, the source here is the International Monetary Fund um, or from Statista. And um, yeah, we can see here that um, we are oscillating something around six um, and seven percent over the last years. And um, although that 
yeah, it doesn't surprise um, anybody watching right now um, when we compare that or when we also have a look at the inflation rate um, in the States, meaning what you can see now is the um, monthly inflation rate over the last 12 years in the United States from August 21 to August, uh, from August 2020 to August 2021. Then we see that, um, yeah, the inflation rate in the US more than doubled over the last um, 12 months. As you know, um, I'm personally from Germany and uh, also in Germany or in the European Union, um, we have a higher inflation rate. We have around 4% right now in Germany. And that is, um, I think, the highest level that we had in the last um, 30 years or so. So what I wanted to show you with that is that we're not talking about a regional phenomenon here, but um, a global one. And when we're thinking about um, inflation, yeah, what is inflation? It's basically um, yeah, a metric to measure the situation or the demand and supply of goods and services on the one hand, and on the other hand, um, yeah, the availability um, of money in the system. Um, meaning, um, yeah, usually the goal of most central banks is to keep um, through their monetary policy, the inflation kind of stable in the European Union, the European Central Bank is usually aiming for around 2%. And um, yeah, I think in the Caribbean, they are a little more flexible with that, more in the 4% region, region. But in the US, they're also aiming for 2%. So um, the question then becomes, all right, what causes that um, higher inflation that we are seeing right now? And um, yeah, probably everybody um, yeah, watching or listening right now probably experienced that um, in your personal life. Maybe you know, you're filling the gas tank in your car gets more expensive. Your weekly trips to the grocery store get more and more expensive. Your electricity bill um, is increasing and so on. Um, you probably have your own examples. Um, and in my opinion, we have two drivers um, that are driving inflation right now. Because on the one hand, um, we have the situation that most governments or most central banks around the world um, yeah, ramped up their spending. Um, they, you know, a lot of huge emergency bills uh, were passed, meaning um, yeah, a lot of governments uh, kind of made packages to support the economy uh, and the financial sector and uh, yeah, supply chain and so on, meaning they put a lot of money into the system to fight um, yeah, the effects of the COVID-19 um, pandemic. And of course, uh, yeah, no government in the world uh, has actual money. What are they doing? They borrowing that money. Therefore, yeah, the whole um, amount of money that is in the system or in the debt system is increasing. Therefore, we have an increasing um, amount of money um, on the one side. And on the other side, also caused through the um, COVID-19 um, pandemic, we have supply chain disruptions, we have labor shortages all around the globe. Therefore, we have limited um, supply of goods and services worldwide. So we have basically both effects um, yeah, coming into play. On the one hand, we have more money in the system. And on the other hand, we have less goods and services that we can actually buy with that um, money. And uh, one graph that kind of um, yeah, really uh, kind of visualizes the current situation when we're talking about goods and services um, or the supply chain um, situation, everybody in logistics or transportation, um, yeah, maybe or probably knows that graph. So yeah, over the last years, when you want to ship uh, 40 foot container that would probably cost you roughly something around 2000, 2500 US dollar. And right now, meaning October 2021, um, we're talking about yeah, roughly five times um, that amount, meaning we're talking about something around 10K in US dollar, meaning yeah, the we see a real spike in global container shipping costs um, because yeah, we still have production going um, in a lot of parts of the world. So, um, yeah, a lot of companies have goods 
that they need to ship that they need to get to their customers but um, yeah we have uh, yeah basically not enough uh, container ships that uh, can yeah, send all these goods uh, to the customers for example you might have heard about the current situation in the uk where they basically do not have enough truck drivers to get uh, the goods and services then from the ports to the people so that's a kind of domino um, effect that we are seeing here you might remember um, yeah, at the beginning of the year um, the blockage of the Suez Canal with um, I think Evergreen was the name of the container ship that got stuck and um, I by no means a supply chain expert but we're still seeing the, the ripple effects um, of that scenario for example um, another nice um, image um, that I want to show you is that is yeah from this morning um, from marinetracker.com um, the LA harbor and um, yeah basically every little of these dots um, is a ship and uh, the green ones are container ships and yeah you can see that all these ships are um, yeah are not in the harbor uh, yet they are still waiting to get cleared and to uh, yeah get the cargo from board I don't know the right term but um, yeah we still have that kind of traffic jam traffic jam in the global um, supply chain then um, yeah we talked or touched about that um, very brief briefly right now um, that is uh, that these are the gas prices um, in the UK for example at the moment um, so yeah we see a four or five time uh, increase um, in the energy prices um, there and winter hasn't even started yet in the northern hemisphere so um, yeah we're seeing basically increasing prices um, all over the globe um, on the one hand um, on the other hand uh, yeah supply chain mess um, everywhere so that is kind of yeah one I think uh, situational one risk that um, we have to be aware and I will yeah talk in a minute a little bit about how all of these factors um, yeah maybe come into play um, over the next uh, yeah over the next one two three years because I think at least from a personal perspective or experience um, a lot of people uh, maybe a lot of business owners or um, decision makers still haven't really or are still kind of living from hope meaning um, they may not have um, done the necessary decisions or kind of postponed them or the necessary investments um, in the right maybe technology or strategy or whatever it might be to um, yeah, prepare for these um, upcoming events and um, to a certain degree we still yeah kind of dodged uh, some some bullets um, from an economic perspective and maybe the yeah the biggest impacts um, are yet to come um, yeah I could show you other images of the Suez Canal here or um, the Panama Canal for example yeah where we all see that little traffic jams um, happening but um, I don't want to yeah uh, bore you with uh, supply chain and logistics too much um, let's have a look at the debt situation so what we are seeing here is um, yeah, a chart um, the average graduate debt levels in the United States since 2003 so what we see here is basically that um, yeah over the last 10-15 years um, whenever someone graduated in the United States they accumulated more and more debt and I think the co total combined uh, student loan debt in the US is around 1.6 trillion US dollar right now I don't know how many number uh, how many zeros um, that number has probably 12 anyway it's a yeah unimaginable amount um, of money or of debt that we are talking here um, so that is in my eyes a, a potential time bomb that we're having here because um, yeah again um, when we're looking at the economic situation um, a lot of people um, yeah lose or lost their jobs um, and uh, might not get them back we have a 
complete disruption of the workforce uh, situation and so on. So I just want to pose a question into the room, what is going to happen um, to the, in that case, um, American economy if um, yeah, these student loan debts um, are starting to default and if people uh, cannot uh, or will not um, pay them back and stop paying them back. Um, I hope that will not happen. Um, but uh, it's to a certain degree something um, that I would be a little worried uh, or where I see some risk um, right now. So that is more on the consumer side. You could call that consumer debt. I don't know um, what the right term or right title would be um, in that scenario. Um, but I also want to talk about what is happening in uh, China right now. So um, if you are not aware, um, Evergrande, um, I think, is the second largest um, real estate developer uh, in China. And they defaulted on their bond payment, uh, I think, one or two weeks ago, I think September 23rd, something around that date. Um, and now they have a 30 day or in that 30 day period uh, where they still have time to yeah, restructure the debt or pay it back or find whatever um, solution. And um, yeah, that kind of starts to, to affect other, um, other companies in the sector. Um, I think another real estate developer that uh, defaulted on the debt payments is uh, Fantasia, interesting name. Um, and uh, yeah, the current liability of Evergrande is 300 billion um, US dollar. And uh, yeah, how, uh, how did that happen? Um, I personally see some parallels to the subprime uh, mortgage crisis that we saw 2007-2008 unfold um, in the United States, meaning um, yeah, we also saw a real estate boom um, before that because um, yeah, interest rates were low and uh, government incentives were high for banks and for citizens alike um, yeah, to buy houses, uh, real estate, uh, or to invest in real estate. And that, uh, yeah, that high demand uh, drove prices uh, to yeah, newer and newer heights. Therefore, people were able to borrow more and more money to buy more and more real estate and that kind of, um, yeah, uh, overheated at some point in time, meaning we had a super leveraged uh, market. And then um, at some point in time, I think also to fight um, inflation, the um, Fed raised um, the interest rates and that caused basically, again, the default um, of a lot of the debt payments, meaning people couldn't pay their mortgage bills. And then, um, yeah, these mortgage um, that loan, uh, these loans uh, defaulted, uh, meaning um, they, yeah, a lot of them uh, wouldn't be paid back. And uh, the banks that gave these loans, um, yeah, kind of structured that in financial, financial uh, instruments um, and, yeah, sold these kind of loans. And uh, that then had ripple effects on the, yeah, on the global or first on the global financial markets and then also on the global economy, which, yeah, then resulted in the global financial crisis 2008. And uh, yeah, that uh, is, again, kind of the situation or some parallels that I'm seeing uh, now to, to China, because basically the same situation, um, one of the only things how you can invest in assets um, in China as a Chinese citizen is in real estate, because you cannot buy international stocks or stocks in general are very um, yeah, speculative or yeah, not, uh, not the first choice of investment there. So, yeah, most people um, buy real estate, or a lot of people buy real estate that drives prices, uh, that price uh, drives the demand. And, uh, yeah, therefore, the real estate developers were able to borrow more and more money to, you know, build more and more um, real estate. And again, we have the same situation. We have a very leveraged real estate market. And, uh, yeah, that's where also or was also um, overheating, maybe we're seeing that right now. And now, um, yeah, again, we see um, big players that um, are not able to pay um, their, their um, liabilities back. 
And um, yeah, maybe we will see a similar effect on the global economy with that, meaning, um, yeah, I hope not, and I will explain why I think it will not have the same effects, but I see some parallels there, um, meaning, uh, yeah, what if these, um, yeah, these big real estate companies um, have kind of a down spiral, have a ripple effect, um, affect other companies, uh, maybe bring the Chinese economy down, and then that might be spreading into the global economy. Um, so I see yeah, also some risks there. And uh, when we are aware of the fact that a lot of Caribbean companies, a lot of Caribbean governments um, are yeah, entangled uh, with the Chinese government or um, yeah, that the Chinese have um, yeah, big investments in a lot of Caribbean companies, uh, we just need to be aware of that fact. I think uh, at least when you want to be aware of what is going on and how we can maybe prepare for that situation. So um, I think it will not have, or I hope it will not have um, these massive effects that the uh, yeah, default of Lehman Brothers, for example, had in the 2008 uh, financial crisis or that kind of kicked off 2008 financial crisis, um, that the default of Evergrande will not have the same effect. Um, it definitely could be, because we're talking about the same um, yeah, the, the same size roughly here, but not really, I think. Um, Lehman Brothers was 600 billion liabilities, um, Evergrande is like 300 billion, so roughly 50%. Um, but nonetheless, uh, yeah, we're talking big numbers here, especially when that will affect um, other real estate developers and therefore then in the second wave, maybe banks um, in China. Um, but globally speaking, um, yeah, China is not so involved uh, and connected to the rest of the world and the rest of the global economy um, uh, than the US was back in the day. Although, yeah, China is one of the biggest um, economies that we are having um, today, but just because of the yeah, capital market restrictions and so on. And uh, yeah, the money is not flowing so, so freely than the US dollar, I think maybe that limits the effects a little bit to China. But again, nonetheless, the Caribbean is um, yeah, kind of involved uh, in with, with China, so everything that happens in China, uh, every liquidity shortage that we might see, any debt that might, yeah, has to be repaid earlier than thought um, might affect the Caribbean. So I think it's important that we are aware of that situation. So that was a long monologue. Let me have a look at uh, some of the comments we got in the meantime. Um, Robert says, we are currently discussing this exact topic to ensure it is captured in our digital strategy for Dominica and how we educate, equip and educate our people to be more resilient by improving their ability to better their livelihoods by earning income locally and internationally. Yeah, I think generally speaking, um, yeah, Caribbean countries need to find uh, or need to develop their own digital strategy or maybe speaking a little bit more global, they're, they're a new business model. I think that's that's maybe uh, the best way um, to put it, uh, because again, I, I hear over and over again, kind of, yeah, a lot of uh, government officials kind of praying that the tourism is, uh, yeah, tourism sector um, is, or the tourism is coming back and the tourism sector is kind of, um, yeah, uh, getting back to normal. But um, to be honest, I have, my doubts that this is going to happen um, soon. And I'm also um, questioning if that is a, a proper long-term strategy, um, if you're always that dependent on uh, tourism and every time the global economy um, has a hiccup or tourism has a hiccup, that, um, yeah, that then completely devastates the uh, economy. And I think that uh, cannot be the long-term strategy here. First comment from YouTube today. Luxley Francis is a great program to learn more about how the Caribbean economics work and interact with the world economy. There's a must-know program to be able to operate better in today's world. Um, yeah, thank you very much. I am very grateful to hear that it's uh, actually beneficial. Um, yeah, good moment to encourage you guys yeah, to hit the like button. If, if you haven't done so as yet, uh, make sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel if you're on LinkedIn and we're not connected yet, uh, make sure to change that. Um, yeah, make sure to connect with me on LinkedIn. The name should be seen here. 
So I'll just type that in and you should find me there. And um, yeah, that's why I think it's important to have these conversations and um, yeah, to talk about these things to get a little understanding what is happening in the world. And again, I'm by no mean um, an expert. Um, I'm just trying to share yeah, my experience and my viewpoints, what I'm seeing, hearing and uh, yeah, learning and talking to people in my day to day business. So let's jump um, into the question from the you. I don't know. Sorry for butchering the name from Mr. Zalazar. Um, the question is again, how can the Caribbean mitigate the economic impact of climate change against the backdrop of COVID-19 supply chain disruptions and increasing costs of insurance? And I think, um, I think we need to have a, a multi, how do you say that? So, yeah, a multifaceted um, approach in that um, regard, because I think there's uh, yeah, no one size fits all um, solution in, in that situation. But um, yeah, can share one of the things that, that I would do. Um, so yeah, increasing costs of insurance. Maybe let's let's talk about that first. Um, so as you might know, um, some of the biggest uh, reinsurance companies um, are located in Germany, um, namely Munich Re or Münchner Rück, Münchner Rückversicherung in German. Um, so what is a reinsurance company doing? So a reinsurance company is basically the insurance company for insurance companies. So if you are um, yeah, a local insurance company in the Caribbean, for example, and you insure, um, yeah, let's say houses um, or whatever, um, then uh, you might have, let's say, a thousand different houses that you have insured over or insured over different islands, but you still have a very uh, localized risk. Um, for example, you mentioned uh, climate change um, in that context. For example, yeah, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but yeah, hurricane season uh, is there or coming up. So meaning, uh, yeah, one hurricane, one earthquake, one, uh, yeah, natural disaster and catastrophe can basically uh, wipe out your complete uh, portfolio as an insurance company. So what are you going to do? Um, yeah, you take your risk and you kind of insure that risk, meaning you go to an reinsurance company, for example, a big uh, company like the Munich uh, reinsurance company, and uh, yeah, you pay a fee and uh, basically outsource your risk, or at least try to hedge um, some of the risk that you are having there. And of course, um, yeah, climate change uh, in general um, is raising these kind of natural risk or natural disasters. And uh, yeah, insurance companies, reinsurance companies, of course, know that, that they use um, yeah, satellite imagery um, and whatever data is available to build their insurance models and to therefore then uh, base their pricing uh, on that. So, um, yeah, with increasing risks, we also see increasing um, prices for insurance. So, um, yeah, I think for most companies, it's probably too expensive um, to, yeah, uh, basically insure their uh, or hedge their, their complete uh, risk or their complete portfolio. But I think um, it should be definitely a part of a strategy, meaning, yeah, to figure out, all right, uh, in what situation and what kind of scenario um, does the insurance uh, make sense? And of course, there are only certain types of uh, businesses that um, actually make sense. And um, yeah, we also have to be honest, um, a lot of smaller businesses, medium-sized businesses in the Caribbean do not have access to these kind of financial um, instruments to yeah, actually hedge some of their risks. For example, yeah, most farmers in the Caribbean do not have access to um, future contracts um, to yeah, hedge their, their um, commodity or agriculture uh, crop prices um, against that kind of natural disasters, floods, droughts, whatever it might be. So that, I think, will always be um, kind of limited. I think um, the maybe bigger um, leverage um, that a Caribbean organization, company, government, whatever, has in the current situation is to use 
data in that scenario, um, or not only data, but uh, to prepare better for these kind of events. Meaning, um, I mentioned that the insurance company are using um, yeah, data, satellite imagery, um, climate models, etc., cetera, um, to, to, um, yeah, to calculate these risks. And I think um, that should be a starting point for, um, yeah, for every organization, for every business to get direct access to the data. And I know there are yeah, enough companies in the Caribbean that, for example, um, offer um, yeah, mapping data, GIS, shout out to Sean Clark. Um, yeah, he basically with um, his company does that work, meaning yeah, providing um, yeah, satellite imagery, um, uh, GPS data, etc., um, to map um, certain risks um, on that level. Um, so that could be a starting point. Same with uh, supply chain. I think um, most companies in the Caribbean do not really um, use um, yeah, digital technologies, um, maybe blockchain or data in general to manage their supply chain um, efficiently. And uh, I think that is um, also big uh, or important starting point to make sure um, that you actually know what is happening in your supply chain. What are the risks? What are the bottlenecks? Uh, and yeah, how can you diversify your risk um, from, from that perspective? So that if one supplier maybe uh, defaults cannot deliver, do you have another one that can uh, jump in? Where is your goods at what point in time? Um, things of that nature. And I think that's what I said a little earlier. I think a lot of companies um, haven't done these moves yet. Um, they are yeah, kind of busy um, putting fires out uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, which is yeah, uh, normal and, and uh, something that you should do, definitely. But uh, I think we also need to be aware of the yeah, medium and, and long-term perspective here, meaning investing in the right systems, um, making sure that uh, you have the right data available um, for your company, for your organization to make smarter or better decisions. And I think um, that ties into what uh, Robert said a little earlier that, um, yeah, we need to make sure that, um, that we have a complete uh, digital strategy in, in that regard. And I think that can um, yeah, mitigate a lot of risks um, and also diversify um, a lot of risks. It cannot eliminate it completely, but um, that's life and business. There's always some um, risk left. But um, to answer the, the question, how what can we do to mitigate um, the yeah, economic impact um, of the yeah, current situation or the COVID-19 pandemic is, of course, on the one hand, yeah, maybe buy insurance, uh, depending on your business and your business model, your organization. Um, but on the one hand, also make sure um, or to figure out, okay, um, what can you do by yourself? What can your organization do by yourself? Uh, what data do you have available? What data can you purchase? Um, what yeah, their strategy do you have to put in place to um, yeah, maybe reduce some risks uh, from your end? And then, of course, the risk that you cannot eliminate from your end completely, then maybe um, yeah, thinking about insurances uh, that are available. All right, another question from LinkedIn. Um, Desta is asking, what risk-based strategies can be considered when extending credit when extending credit facilities to SME in the Caribbean? Um, I am not so sure if I understand um, the question, maybe. You can rephrase it. Do you mean what um, strategies can credit institutes, meaning banks, do to um, yeah to lower or to diversify their risks, um, or from from a business side? I'm not really sure if I understand the question uh, correctly. Again, um, yeah, I think the timer says 40 minutes now. Um, I want to open the, the panel uh, for discussion here. So if you do not want to type in um, your comments uh, into the chat, and if you want to come uh, yeah, on, on video, feel comfortable doing that. 
and uh, yeah, want to share your thoughts or maybe ask your questions, then um, yeah, feel free to uh, yeah say or raise your hand in the chat or whatever, uh, and then I will drop the link and then maybe can have a conversation or I bring you on. So Robert is saying um, the Dominica Creat C R E A D. No, don't know how to pronounce that. Economic growth team in collaboration with a group of international partners has developed an innovative hurricane protection product that will allow households, small businesses, and farmers to buy protection against the damaging effects of future hurricanes using blockchain. Yeah, and I think um, that is one of the yeah, practical use cases um, that we have with blockchain or that uh, where blockchain can be used. Um, I, yeah, I'm, I'm, to be honest, I'm not sure if the Caribbean itself um, is big enough to to kind of um, yeah diversify um, that risk um, good enough. So, um, when I'm a financial analyst here or a risk analyst, I would be very interested uh, in the group of international partners because they are probably crucial to um, yeah bring in the money or diversify the risk uh, or whatever the strategy is behind it. Um, but I think, um, yeah, it would be um, a great thing if it would be easier or cheaper for households um, in the Caribbean to purchase that kind of protection or insurance um, in that case, for example, for, um, for hurricanes, definitely. Yeah, you're well, very welcome, I hope. Um, yeah, it was helpful and I could uh, answer your question at least partially. But again, I think um, everything that we are talking about here um, are super complex, not necessarily complicated, but complex um, systems um, that we are dealing with. So um, I think it's hard to give a definite uh, or yeah, one-sided answer. Um, this is saying yes, correct. Um, I still don't know what yes, correct uh, mean. Maybe you can just rephrase. Uh, your question, and then uh, yeah, I'm more than happy to answer it. <laughs> what is your guys' um, yeah personal experience? Do you think that uh, your most executives, uh, decision makers, um, are optimistic um, or too optimistic um, about the future, too pessimistic? Uh, do people have done the right preparation or the right investments um, yeah, in the right things uh, to be prepared? Because I think, yeah, again, what we may be seeing right now is a kind of yeah, whiplash effect uh, where we see a very small effect maybe at the at the beginning but it then gets amplified amplified over time and then at some point in time yeah we have um, we have that big bang that big crash um, i don't know about that yet but again um, we're seeing rising inflation rates all over the globe primarily because yeah there's more money in the system to fight the covid 19 um, pandemic. Um, on the other hand, uh, yeah, we have major supply chain disruptions. Um, yeah, experts say that uh, they will not be fixed till the end of 2022, meaning yeah, at least a year. Um, so yeah, goods and services, or yeah, primarily goods, not so much services, but goods do not reach uh, the end consumer, do not reach the the customer, um, and uh, yeah, that is driving inflation. Then. Also, on the other hand, uh, yeah, we're seeing increasing debt default risks, meaning yeah, because a lot of uh, companies, uh, not companies, a lot of countries um, have a high GDP to debt uh, ratio, and now because of the current economic downturn, yeah, struggling um, with refinancing or with uh, paying their liabilities um, on a yeah bigger level on a um, yeah, let's call it. Uh, company scale. We're seeing that uh, in China right now with the default uh, of big players in the real estate sector with Evergrande, 300 billion um, liabilities there. Uh, yeah, Fantasia um, the other day. So um, yeah, we're seeing a lot of economic things unfolding and I don't want to even touch on um, yeah, more critical things like um, yeah, maybe military conflicts uh, with China and Taiwan and Australia and so on. Um, yeah, 
so um, that is just my my current situation. So um, yeah, let's do the following. Let's drop the link in the chat. Let me see if this is working. And um, yeah, if you have a question or um, I hope that worked, um, or if you want to yeah, join the, the live stream and have a conversation with me, share your thoughts or whatever, feel free to click the link that I just dropped in the chat. Um, it says to me that you can see it in the YouTube um, chat. I'm not sure if you can see it um, in the LinkedIn um, chat or if you have access to it through the LinkedIn live stream. So um, yeah, if you want to join and if you are on LinkedIn right now, you might want to switch over to the YouTube channel. Um, if you haven't subscribed yet, um, then now is the right point in time to do so. Um, meaning, yeah, just type in my name into YouTube. You see it down here. It's pronounced Kuiper, by the way. Um, and then you should find me. And uh, yeah, then feel free to join me and uh, yeah, let's have a conversation. In the meantime, we have another question from Denise. What do you think about central banks increasing policy rates as a response to rising inflation rates and not necessarily on a holistic basis? Um, good question, first of all. Again, I see some, um, yeah, some parallels to the situation that we had in 2008, um, where we basically came out um, yeah, an economic uh, growth period, uh, stock markets were rising, uh, real estate markets were rising and so on. And uh, yeah, everybody was happy. Everybody um, made a lot of money. Um, yeah, times were good, good old days. And then, um, yeah, inflation um, increased and uh, same situation there. Um, the, the central bank, the Fed uh, raised the, the interest rates uh, to fight inflation or as a response to, to increasing inflation rates. And uh, that then caused uh, a lot of default, uh, with a lot of debt, globally speaking. And um, to your question, I think um, I'm not sure if a lot of central banks or governments actually have that weapon um, today, right now. I mean, in theory, yes, and uh, we're already seeing that that some central banks are yeah, increasing uh, or uh, raising um, the, the interest rates. But um, I think the big problem that we have um, right now or still having as a kind of inherited from the 2008 financial crisis is that huge debt that still a lot of um, countries in that case um, accumulated um, during that time period and that they didn't pay back. Meaning, uh, yeah, terms like quantitative easing and so on um, uh, might come into mind. Um, meaning, again, back in the day, um, the central banks basically flooded uh, the financial markets with money, lend a lot of money to the, uh, to the governments, to the countries, um, yeah, to fight, again, the, the economic uh, crisis and to prevent the complete financial collapse, basically. And um, to be honest, um, again, I have a background in, in finance and, and banking. Um, that's, yeah, I, I lived through that. Um, and to be honest, from a regulatory side, from a banking side, nothing really changed. So banking or well, the banks still do business uh, like they did um, back in the day. That didn't really change um, a lot. And on the other hand, uh, most governments or most countries didn't pay um, their or any debt for that matter back or they increased it uh, even more. I mean, uh, we had the conversation the other day, I think, in the US um, where they uh, weren't able to to repay um, or refinance some of their debt that they have because they are increasing it over and over again um, over the last um, decades. So um, to answer your question, I think a lot of uh, central banks do not have that instrument um, or at least not the full power of that instrument because if they would raise um, the interest rates, then that would also um, cause the, um, the raise of the bond payments that a lot of governments would have um, to pay, um, meaning their debt um, repayments would increase and um, a lot of governments, uh, a lot of 
countries still do not have uh, the money to do so. Meaning, um, yeah, for example, let's say again, take Germany. Germany is um, able to yeah, raise money um, on the capital markets globally for 1%, uh, 0%, um, depending on the duration that we are talking. I think it's the 10 year bond for German government is like 1%, something around that. Don't quote me on that. Um, and just think about what would happen um, yeah, if we would only increase that number by 1%. Now the debt payments of the German government would be 2%, meaning it would be double the amount that it is today. And uh, maybe a yeah, strong economy like, like Germany or, or European countries would be able to do that um, on a very limited scale. Um, but I think um, a lot of other countries, uh, maybe especially Caribbean countries, um, which are already uh, in a lot of debt, which have already um, problems to get access to the capital markets and to, yeah, to actually raise uh, or, or lend uh, money. Um, so I think that can be very problematic um, and we will see how this is going to play out um, if they yeah, find the right uh, balance. Um, and uh, yeah, what the next years will, will bring. But um, I have my doubts if they actually can you know, yeah, raise interest rates without risking, um, yeah, again, the default uh, of governments um, or government bonds um, in that scenario. <clears throat> okay, another question, how would CBDC likely assist in economic recovery for the Caribbean region? Hmm, hot topic. And uh, yeah, I think I had at least I think two live streams or two conversations over the last weeks um, yeah, about central bank digital currencies and the pros and cons and uh, yeah, everything around it. So feel free to um, check that out again, also available on uh, my YouTube channel. All the replays um, are there, I think, you know, two hour conversations around the topic. Um, but to answer your question, um, I think generally speaking, again, um, everything or every technology policy, however you want to call it, that uh, kind of enables the Caribbean as a whole to yeah, have easier cross-border payments and yeah, encourages, therefore, trade um, yeah, is a good thing. Um, on the other hand, um, Again, I'm also not a big friend um, of too much power um, in yeah, a few hands or in, in centralized power. And that is basically what is happening when we have um, a central bank digital currency. Um, all the monetary power is then at the central bank or a handful of persons. And um, let's say in free countries that might never happen, but you never know who is next year um, or in 10 years down the line, um, the government. Um, and therefore, um, yeah, I would never, or I'm kind of uncomfortable with that notion of, of yeah, so much power in, in one place, um, meaning, yeah, if the government doesn't like you anymore, uh, they can prevent you from buying stuff. They can prevent you from sending other people money from you receiving money or just press a button and yeah, erase all your savings, all the money that you have in, in your wallet or in your bank account. So um, on the one hand, I think it can be a great um, yeah, accelerator um, for cross-border payments and uh, yeah, access to financial markets and transactions in general. But um, I'm also um, yeah, a little skeptical, again, because of that notion, notion that we basically have a, a yeah, centralized system here contrary to um, yeah, blockchain technology, which is a decentralized um, finance system or decentralized technology. And then we, when we talk about cryptocurrencies, we have a decentralized um, finance system. Yeah, you're very welcome, Denise. I hope I could answer the question. And uh, yeah, a very good one, by the way. By the way, question, um, is that link? No, I think I can only post um, to YouTube. So I unfortunately cannot um, drop the link um, to join me during this live stream um, into the LinkedIn chat. So um, yeah, I want to encourage you if you want to join me, I think we'll, still, we'll stay on for a few more minutes. 
um, yeah, feel free to head over to YouTube and uh, join me there. The link is available um, on that platform. I don't know for whatever reason I cannot drop links or cannot drop comments um, into the LinkedIn live stream. Nonetheless, um, yeah, do you guys have any more questions um, or maybe anything that I haven't touched on as yet um, that might be interesting for you guys? Or again, um, yeah, if you want to join me, feel free to head over to YouTube. And of course, I always appreciate any like, any thumbs up, thumbs up uh, yeah, any share with a colleague or a friend where you think um, that should also see that or could benefit from that kind of content. Again, I try to go live at least once a week and yeah, discuss current topics, current development, no matter if it's economics, business strategy, technology, finance, um, all around that. And as long as it's somehow connected um, to the Caribbean and business, then uh, we're probably going to talk about it. So let me have a look at my notes. Did I talk about everything that I wanted to talk about? I talked about inflation, I talked about um, yeah, big global um, debt risks that we have on the one hand with the student loan debt in the US and uh, yeah, a high GDP to debt ratio in a lot of countries um, and also yeah, very over leveraged and overheated real estate sector um, in China. <clears throat> We're seeing yeah, the global supply chain shortage, um, ripple effects through the pandemic, uh, labor shortage, and so on. Then we had, yeah, again, at the beginning of the year, the evergreen that blocked the Swiss Canal, and we still see the ripple effects in the global supply chain here. So again, uh, yeah, if you haven't ordered your Christmas presents for your loved ones yet, um, yeah, you might be already late, but uh, maybe you can, uh, maybe you are still in time, but uh, I would make sure place your orders now. And um, yeah, the climate change, um, we also touched on that, how that will affect um, yeah, the Caribbean or how you can mitigate the risks uh, of, of climate change um, to the Caribbean. And I think, yeah, it's kind of a multifaceted approach here. Again, on the one hand, use technology, um, whatever it is, um, geomapping, climate models, um, whatever it is, uh, blockchain, to yeah, maybe develop products, uh, develop strategies, develop solutions to yeah, mitigate the risks uh, wherever possible from, from your end. And then on the other side, um, yeah, maybe have a look at uh, the insurance side of things and the risks that you cannot uh, reduce or mitigate on your end. You then maybe can hedge or outsource to insurance or depending on your size um, to a reinsurance company. Again, some of the big names, uh, Munich or Münchner Rückversicherung, German companies. I think Germany has one of the three biggest uh, reinsurance companies. I'm not sure about that, but might be true. All right, so it looks like nobody wants to join me here. Um, I understand that um, yeah, you probably were maybe not uh, in the right circumstances. Nonetheless, it was worth a try. I hope um, yeah, it was nonetheless beneficial for you. I hope um, yeah, you learned something and uh, maybe my thoughts and viewpoints um, help you yeah, be aware of some things, of some risks um, that we might facing and maybe also a handful of ideas uh, what you can do now to prevent them or to at least prepare for them uh, so that when they come, you're not uh, yeah, catched without any or caught without any preparation. Um, that being said, um, again, if you want more of that content, make sure to connect with me on LinkedIn. If you haven't done so as yet, um, make sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel. Um, yeah, hit the bell notification so that you get notified whenever um, I go live or drop a new um, video. And I uh, also have a newsletter where I um, yeah, share my thoughts uh, about the current situation and uh, yeah, economic developments, business strategy, technology, and so on. A weekly, weekly publication, Simon Says, you can also find that um, yeah, on my website. You can sign, sign up there, or there should also be a link available uh, in the description down below. And if the link isn't there, yet during the live stream uh, if you're watching this as a replay 
the link should be there then. So we have one more comment. Um, Robert says, uh, regarding the purchase of gifts, it is not that bad in the Caribbean as most of our purchases via Amazon. Um, great to hear that. Um, although um, yeah, I'm hearing uh, more and more from people that even Amazon um, struggles with um, yeah, delivery in time. So um, yeah, but glad to hear um, if you do not have that big of a problem in the Caribbean or in Dominica, I think you're from Robert, right? Correct me if I'm wrong. But um, yeah, if you do not have that problems in Dominica yet, um, at least some positive thing that the Christmas gifts will arrive in time. All right, everybody, that's it so far from my side. I uh, yeah wish you a great week. I hope you had a great week so far. And uh, I hope to see you the next time. And uh, yeah, that's it for today. Have a good one. Bye-bye.